Well, here we are with the new Volkswagen Amarok, the latest player in Australia's highly competitive double cab ute segment. Now, as we know, the Amarok is the new Ford Ranger cousin. But is it the same? Is it better? Well, to find out, we're gonna see how it stacks up against two of its key competitors, the Benchmark Toyota Hilux and the other fast-moving changer, the Isuzu D-Max. Now I can hear you already. If this is based on the Ranger and it's so similar to the Ranger, where is the Ranger? Well, it's parked up just over there. It is our current best double cab ute and the standing drive car of the year. So to see which of these three is the best, we will then tomorrow put that up against the Ranger. So plenty to get through. To find out though where everything stands, let's run through the specs of the SR5, the X-Terrain and the Panamericana Amarok to see where they all stack up. The Toyota Hilux SR5 4x4 Automatic starts our lineup. It is the oldest car here. The eighth generation Hilux originally launched in 2015 and it's priced at $61,930. Our car adds $675 crystal pearl metallic white paint and the $2,500 premium leather interior for a total of $65,105 before on roads. The Hilux is powered by a 150 kilowatt, 500 newton meter, 2.8 litre four cylinder turbo diesel engine and has a claimed combined cycle fuel consumption of 7.9 litres per 100 kilometres. Next dual cab off the rank is the Isuzu D Max X Terrain, which arrived as an all new car in 2020. As the range topper, the X Terrain is priced from $67,500 and we've added the $650 magnetic red mica paint for $68,150 before on roads. Now take that price with a grain of salt though, as Isuzu often have strong drive away deals, which currently list the X-Terrain at $64,990 drive away, making its value proposition pretty hard to ignore. Under the bonnet is a 140 kilowatt, 450 newton meter, three liter four cylinder turbo diesel, which returns a claimed combined cycle fuel consumption of eight liters per 100 kilometers. Now to the Challenger, the all new Volkswagen Amarok, we tried to get our hands on the $70,990 Amarok style to position it closer to the other utes, but due to the newness of the model could only get this $75,990 Panamericana version. It adds painted wheels and sports bars, a tub liner, premium sound system and leather seats over the style, but shares the same mechanical underpinnings. Our car adds deep red metallic paint for $990 to round out $76,980 before on-road costs. That's a solid $10,000 uplift on both our competitors that we'll do our best to work around. You do get a bit more where it counts, however, with the Amarok featuring a 184 kilowatt, 600 newton meter, three liter turbocharged V6 under the bonnet and an 8.4 liter per 100 kilometer combined cycle consumption claim. Now with all these important numbers done, let's spend some time to reacquaint ourselves with our two big name challenges to see where the Amarok's benchmark has been set. Right, well the Hilux has got it's a hard won reputation based on practicality and I guess rugged reliability. And a good place to start with that is the tub. It's pretty no frills back here. No tub liner standard on SR5, but it is very usable. It's 1570 mil deep, 1109 mil between the arches, 495 mil deep, and it has a 990 kilo payload, which obviously is not a ton, but we'll get onto that in a tick. Standard tow pack on this thing is three and a half ton, which is pretty standard for a ute, and you've got four uh, integrated tie down points within the bed itself. Now, what you don't get are any power outlets, and as I mentioned, there is no standard tub liner, although Toyota do offer uh, liners and covers as part of their accessory catalog. Let's take a look at the Isuzu. Now, the Isuzu, oh, as well as having gas shocks on the back there, has coffee cup holders built into the tailgate, which I personally love. Now, the tub on the back here does look a lot more fancy than on the Toyota. You've got an integrated bed liner, you've got a, a built-in hard roller shutter there. I'll get to that in a second. It's smaller than the Toyota, 1460 long, 1105 between the arches, but it is deeper at 522 uh, from the top down. Payload on the Isuzu is lower than the Toyota as well, at only 935 kilos, because you are carting around the, uh, the B&D roller door shutter that sits in the back here. Now, it's good for security. It means if you are using a car like the X-Terrain to do your shopping or keeping your tools or your gym bag or whatever it is in the back, it's secure, it's lockable, it makes sense. But it's heavy, it's annoying, it slips all the way down the back there. You cannot reach 
uh, the back of the bulkhead, and there are only two tie-down points on this car, which is a little bit of a limitation, especially if you are using your ute crazily as a ute. With the business end of the Hilux and D-Max covered, let's take a look in the cabins. Well, look, sitting in the back of a Hilux, how can you equate this? If you've flown a long interstate haul in economy in a plane that's actually had the seats compacted a little bit so they can fit a few more people in, and then the person in front of you kind of wiggles around and puts their seat back back, yeah, that's pretty much where we are, because if you have a look, I've got a reasonable toe room underneath that seat. My knees do fit into the scallop of the seat. This is in my driving position, by the way. But my hair's hitting the roof. I'm a little bit hunched over. The backrest is up really quite straight. I don't know if I would last the whole way, certainly not without a, a drink service to come down the aisle, of which there is not one. But look, jokes aside, it... It works. Like so many parts of the Hilux, the back of it, it does what it needs to do. It's pretty basic, it's pretty simple. The windows do go down all the way, which is a big tick for me, but it's pretty rudimentary. So if again, you're looking at this as the, uh, as the family vehicle and you've got maybe younger children, you've got Isofix points on both outriggers, you've got an armrest with cup holders here, and of course there's storage under the seats as well. So ticks the boxes, but doesn't really kind of leave you with any sort of feeling that you want to spend a lot more time back here, especially on a long drive. Right, well, keeping our airline uh, analogies going, if the Hilux was a cramped economy, the D-Max is, well, it's economy plus, isn't it? I've got a lot more leg room. That seat's still in my driving position. I've got a lot more headroom. The leather and the seats are super, super comfy. If you are looking at one of these, now this is the same as the BT50 as well, uh, un underneath, but if you're shopping for one and family comfort is a pretty key thing, just go and sit in the back row of a D-Max. It is super, super comfy. They've done a great job here. You've got air vents, you've got a USB port. Oh, you've got the armrest with cup holders. You've got Isofix seats, so tick, tick, tick. Like we saw in the Toyota, it's pretty standard stuff. And again here, the windows do go all the way down. One thing that is worth noting, and it's probably more of a frustration if you're a cameraman, but it's really dark back here. You've got black seats, black headliner, black everything. Yeah, it's a little bit kind of glum, I suppose, but it's certainly a lot more comfortable than the Toyota and a lot more roomy than the Toyota, if still a little bit compromised because of course it is a ute. Now, if you have not spent time in the front of a Hilux and wonder why are these things so popular, just go and do it because the functionality and layout of this thing, there's a reason Toyota doesn't change things uh, on a whim. It really is an ergonomic kind of masterpiece here. Hands on the wheel, you can easily reach your air conditioning controls down here, which are knobs and easy to use. You can easily reach your high low range switch down here, which is a knob and easy to use. The touchscreen, it's right there, it's an eight inch. I'll get onto that in a tick. Buttons on the steering wheel, really nice and easy to use. Your cruise control stalk is under the steering wheel. Everything is designed to be easy and uh, I guess blind to use. And by that, I mean, if you're concentrating out the front as you should be, you can reach down and feel these things without actually having to look at what they are. That is how the Toyota interior works so well. So continual big tick. Now storage and practicality around here is actually another big thing. You've got twin glove boxes, the upper box and a, uh, a standard lower box there. You've got a center console here, which has got a main style outlet. So forget all that whiz bang about electric cars having vehicle to load, your Hilux can do it. Uh, you've got two cup holders, you've got a key tray, you've got two 12 volt outlets, and I'm gonna run through all the USB ports in the car, okay? So get ready, just in case you lose count. One, I'll go through it again. One, one USB port in the entire car. So come on Toyota, you can do better than that. Uh, this car does have heated seats, uh, which are here, and again, buttons, so they're nice and easy to use. From a seating and visibility and general kind of comfort perspective, it's actually really good up here. The, the Hilux feels supportive, the seats are good, the driving position and your visibility is great. You've got grab handles here on the A-pillar, but they don't get in the way uh, of your visibility. The mirrors are good. Everything about this car has been designed for the driver in mind. And it is something to keep in mind if you are shopping for a double cab ute, that if you are the driver, you're the person who's gonna be spending most of the time here. It does need to work for you before it works for anyone else in the back seats. And that's kind of Toyota's modus brandi. 
Now, the first thing about the Isuzu that you notice is that they have obviously learned from Toyota. And I guess if you're gonna use the benchmark as your benchmark, it actually makes a lot of sense. There's some elements of this cabin and layout that work really well in the same way they do in the Hilux. For example, the high range, low range dial here, you can reach that, you know exactly where it is. It feels like it feels. You don't need to look away from the road if you do need to use it. However, they've tried to smarten it up and modernize it. So we'll start with the seats, which immediately feel more comfortable and more supportive than what you get in the Toyota. It was like we saw in the back seat here. It's a finer quality uh, material that they've used. It's tried to give the, the D-Match, certainly in the, uh, the X-Terrain, a more upmarket feel. You've even got you know, fancy red stitching across your dashboard. In terms of storage, you've got three glove boxes, not just two, as we go through, which, you know, is pretty cool. This one, uh, you gotta be careful what you stick in there. Someone will remain nameless, may have put some road snacks in there. It gets really hot. So your jelly snakes kind of turn into this kind of really yucky blob. Don't do it, keep it for parking tickets and all that sort of stuff. That's my tip. Um, you've got cup holders here in the center. You've got slide out cup holders in front of the air vents, which is actually kind of cool on a, on a hot drive because you can use the, uh, the air conditioning to cool down your drink. A nine inch infotainment system here, You've got lots of other bits and pieces that seem to work well, so now let's go through the bad stuff. Like the Toyota, we have got one USB port just here. Now there is one in the back, and there's only one 12 volt outlet, there's no uh, main style outlet here. So while we did kind of play a bit of fun in the Toyota, the Isuzu's not that much better. And guys, this is a working vehicle, right? You've got people who use these as their business, as their play, they go camping. Putting USB ports and power outlets and other things like that around the cabin would be a great way to improve these things. That's my tip. Um, in terms of, uh, I guess, living with the car as well, that blackness that we mentioned from the back has a similar carry over here. You've got really thick A-pillars, um, which don't really impede on you too much, but they are thicker than what you saw in the Toyota. You feel like you're sitting a little bit lower with a, a thinner windscreen, so it's a bit more car-like, but again, if you're using this off-road or you're using this as a, as a working vehicle, you want as much visibility as you can get. It's not bad by any stretch, but it is definitely a, a comparison point. So I think so far in looking at these two cars, and excuse me that a ding just went off, which actually, let's talk about that because the Isuzu, when you're driving it, I'm gonna turn that one off, it serves as a good reminder. This thing beeps and blops at you every step of the way. You've got a rather in, sort of uh, intrusive driver assistance system that doesn't mind a beep or a buzzer and it can be really, really annoying when you know what you're doing and you may have to move around the road. Uh, you just don't need to be reminded of it every second of every day. So it's something there. And there are a few frustrations with the interface here on the, uh, on the touchscreen that I'll go through when we go for a drive. But like I was saying before rudely interrupted by a beep, the, the, the approach taken by both the Hilux and the D-Max are really, really solid positions to start from. And I think where we've seen in the past, the Hilux is great as a working truck and great off-road. The Isuzu is perhaps a bit more refined, but still great off-road. You do need to test the two back to back. So we're gonna go for a drive now and then pull our thoughts and go and sit in the Volkswagen and see what a new taste on the latest platform can bring to the working ute market. Ah, the Hilux. Now, if you're like me, you've got your favorite pair of kind of work boots or, or your, your, your knock around shoes, right? That you use if you're working in the garden or you're going somewhere. That's what a Hilux is like to drive. You get back in and you're like, now I, uh, I know exactly where we are. We know what we're gonna get out of each other. This car is not trying to be more, I guess, luxurious and refined than it is. It is just that staple workhorse, and there's so many good things about it in, in that way. So going through the, uh, the, the basics at the first, you've got a 2.8 litre four-cylinder turbo diesel engine that's got uh, 150 kilowatts and 500 newton metre output. It is a pretty long-standing Toyota engine. You find it in the Hilux, in the Fortuna, in the Prado, and you know what? It is good enough. It's not a hot rod. It's not the most refined thing. But I tell you what, when you put the car into its power mode, it still feels punchy off the mark. If you try to run the car in, a, in an eco mode, you can get pretty close to the, uh, the high sevens that Toyota claim uh, for litres per hundred fuel consumption on this thing. You'll generally see under 10 litres per hundred consumption. It's just a really, really reliable, bankable kind of 
vanilla platform. And you know what? I really like vanilla. It works so well. Driving the Hilux, yeah, okay, you can probably see us moving around. It's still a ute. It's taut. It's, it's always working, I guess, is the thing. Uh, but it's still comfortable. It's still uh, very kind of easy to use, even though at speed, like we're only doing 60 kilometers an hour at the moment, and the steering's nice and light. You get to slower speeds, it can be a little bit heavier. But at touring speeds, these things just eat up the miles. You, you sit on 80 to 100, really effortless, really, really easy to live with. And that is, a, uh, I guess, a key part of why you see so many Toyotas on the road in Australia. Now, a quick word on the infotainment system here in the Hilux, eight inch touchscreen, it's well featured. So here are the good points. You get DAB, you get AM, FM, it's got integrated navigation, you've got big chunky buttons, so it's relatively easy to, uh, to get that first point of access to. And it's got support for Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, which is a good thing because the downside is it's actually really annoying to use, certainly when you're on the move. The interface feels decades old. Finding things like scrolling through radio stations can be really fiddly. There are lots of kind of little nuanced menus and things throughout there. So again, once you get used to it and you're not really changing too many things, fair enough, it's gonna be okay. But if you are the sort of person that uses the infotainment system and wants to change settings and needs to change radio stations, there are far easier to use systems on the market. And my tip always in a Toyota is to use uh, the, uh, the Apple CarPlay or Android Auto projection that goes on. So here's one fun thing about Toyotas. We always say, Toyotas, they're so old school, they're so reliable, you even get this really simple digital clock here in the middle of the dash. But you wanna know what's funny, you've got a clock built into the GPS system that is using satellites to tell it what time it is based on the atomic clock in Greenwich or something. But the digital clock up here on the dashboard isn't actually connected to that, and you have to set your, your own hours and minutes and things like that, like you used to on your old Casio uh, wristwatch. Uh, why? Come on, right? Surely we can connect these systems. It's a clock, for crying out loud, right? We don't really need to, uh, to have the most complex things, but it is typical Toyota. You know you're there when you see the glowing blue digits reminding you of just how rudimentary things still are in 2023. So now the uh, the other bits and pieces in a modern car. Obviously, we've got driver assistance technology in the uh, in the Hilux. It's got a speed sign recognition capability, so that when you're using cruise control, uh, you can automatically adapt to the speed sign that you've gone past. For example, you're on a country tour, you're in a 100 zone on 100k an hour. You come into a town and it drops. You go past the 80 sign and the 60 sign really quickly. Uh, what it means is you just simply tap on the stalk, and the Hilux just adjusts to the most recent speed sign that it's seen, which is actually really cool. There is a lane keep warning, a lane departure warning, sorry, and a lane keep by braking intervention uh, capability on this, so it's not the electrically adjusted uh, steering that you'll see in more modern cars. It's not driving itself, it's just trying to look after you, and I think that's the way to approach the Hilux. It is not the newest, fanciest, most high-tech kit on the block, it is the benchmark and well you know there is a reason you use something that's pretty solid as your benchmark because i tell you what if this is as good as you get it's still it's still pretty good but this market has been moving on utes are no longer just working tools they're no longer just regional touring tools people use them as the de facto family car these days so let's switch across to the isuzu and see what a little bit more refinement does to driving a ute We've said this a couple of times, is the, the new RG series, Isuzu D-Max, was to take a phrase from my teenage daughter's vocabulary, a glow up, uh, and the glow up of the century. The old D-Max, well, was pretty well past its prime. It was reliable, but by golly, it really sort of felt like a 1990s boombox inside and, and just didn't quite have the quality aura that, that you sort of needed in, in, this, in this market. This new D-Max, and by rights, it's uh, cousin, the Mazda BT-50, massive step forward. And uh, even getting into it now, straight after the Toyota, immediately feels more comfortable, immediately feels lighter. It's a really, really lovely car. Now, interestingly, engine capacity on the D-Max is up on the Toyota. You've got a three liter uh, four cylinder here, but the outputs are down. 140 kilowatts, 450 Newton meters. Now people see those numbers and go, oh geez, I don't know, I need a more powerful vehicle. 
The thing is, is the DMAX does it, it's like a student in class that gets A for achievement but C for effort. It is not trying. This car is so relaxed and so unfazed and so unstressed. The engine, the three liter, uh, it's a four double J three. This is an Isuzu truck engine. So in a, uh, a double cab like this, it's barely working and you find your fuel consumption is down. We've had, I think Isuzu claim high sevens. We have had about mid eights on this car. So less than we have on, uh, on the Toyota on this test. And it will do that time after time. And I think my, one of my better uh, experiences with an Isuzu was towing a race car on a trailer, which would have been about a two and a half ton trailer and I was doing 10 litres per hundred with that on the back. So if you're doing towing, you're doing a lot of touring, this engine is terrific and I think it's a, a, an important thing. In terms of driving comfort, it feels far more premium than the Toyota and it's interesting because the X-Terrain and the SR5 that we've just been in are pretty you know, evenly matched on price so it's not really a numbers thing. The quality of the leather in this, uh, this car just feels really, really nice. It feels a little bit more quiet and better insulated. The electrically assisted steering does make it feel a lot lighter, certainly at low speeds. Get up to, to touring speeds, both cars are still excellent. And I think, again, it's why we've said the Toyota is so popular. It is just effortless on a long drive. The Isuzu is, is right up there as well. The ride quality, again, very comfortable, far less jittery than we found in the Toyota, uh, certainly with nothing in the tub. It just feels a little bit more, and by a little bit more, it feels a lot more refined. And I think that is the key word when you're looking at this. If your Toyota is your benchmark, the Isuzu is your benchmark refined. Now, infotainment wise, you've got this nine inch screen here on the Isuzu, which I don't know if you can hear this, but you get. Do, 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 do. Look, I want to equate it to Super Mario Kart, all the button bloops and bleeps and things that this thing makes. It's not a great system. Now, to be fair, this is a third party unit that's been basically put in. It does what it needs to. Again, you've got DAB radio, you've got integrated navigation, AM, FM, all the bits and pieces. It's got Apple CarPlay support, uh, Android Auto support. So all of that works well. But again, the, the design of the interface feels a bit half done. You do feel that you're better off just using CarPlay or, or Android Auto uh, rather than the native system. And it's a bit of a shame, but I guess it's a nice equaliser that way. Um, but in terms of the screen, it's it's nice and bright, but it's positioned in a way so it's it's flat on the dash. It's looking straight back. If you catch the sun at a bad angle, it can be highly reflect, uh, reflective. And what's really annoying is if you are towing, for example, and you turn your headlights on, it goes into its dimming mode. And there is a, a setting where you can all uh, force it to be always bright, but that means at night it's too bright. What it means is you've got fiddles uh, with this screen and this system that doesn't feel completely integrated. And I think that was something, if you if you paid attention to our Car of the Year stuff, it's where the Ranger really, really had it together. And it felt like a car that had been developed as a holistic platform. And having seen what we've seen in the Toyota and having seen now what we've seen in the Isuzu, let's go and have a look at the Amarok and compare it to both these benchmarks, one the uh, the benchmarky benchmark and the working benchmark, but the other one perhaps the refinement benchmark, uh, just to see, well, how the Amarok fits into this set. Because again, we know it's based on the Ranger, so we're expecting it to be good, but already looking at it, we can see some differences. We know it's priced uh, considerably higher than these cars, so it needs to be uh, a step above in order to, I, I guess, compete in this segment. So let's get the D-Max back to base and check out the Amarok. We've gone through the benchmark, we've gone through the glow up, the Hilux and the D-Max are still both formidable uh, competitors in the double cab ute segment. So let's take a look now at the all-new Amarok. Now, let's call out a couple of things while we're here. 
we asked for the uh, the style grade, which is the kind of mid-pack Amarok, which puts it into pricing context with the X-Terrain and the SR5. This is the second top of the range, the Pan Americana, because it was all that Volkswagen had available uh, at this early stage. This car is around $10,000 more than the Isuzu D-Max. So just keep that in mind when we look at it. All the mechanicals, all the other bits and pieces are common across the range. So it really is just the dress up components of this car that you have to look at and think about and consider when comparing the three. Now, while we are looking at it, look at it. It is a really, really cool looking truck. Volkswagen have done a great job uh, of not only carrying across their familiar branding nose, but modernizing the platform. And I know that we'll, we'll probably do this very shortly, but comparing this to the Ranger, even though they're the same underneath, they are very clearly different vehicles, which is a great thing for Volkswagen buyers. Now, here's a fun tip and a fun bit of information for you. Pan Americana as a name basically means of the Americas. So from north through central to south, it's also Pan Am the airline. There's a Pan American train that runs from Cincinnati to New Orleans. But there's also the Pan American Highway, which is, according to Guinness, the world's longest motorable road, which runs all the way from the tip of Chile up north along the western coast of South and Central America, albeit not uh, through a small spot in Colombia, into the United States. So there you go, be a fun drive in one of these. Well, as they say with utes, it is the automotive mullet. Business in the front, party in the back. And it is a pretty decent party back here. Now it's not as long as the Hilux, 1544 millimeters uh, from tip to bulkhead, which puts it pretty much in between uh, the Hilux and the Isuzu. But in keeping with the Amarok, it is 1224 millimeters between the arches, which means it still fits a pallet in the back, which was, if you recall, when the Amarok launched, that was its big call out. Not sure how often you need to do that, but it's good to know you still can if you need to. Uh, that makes it the widest. It's also the deepest at 529 millimeters deep. So this is an incredibly usable tub. You've got one, two, three, four, five, six tie down points. So four more than the Isuzu, two more than the Toyota. There is no tonneau cover uh, on this spec, but like all these things, you can get them as uh, optional accessories if you need. Now talking payloads, the Amarok is the only one of our trio that has greater than a ton, 1,031 kilos to be exact, which gives it roughly 100 kilos more than the D-Max. Something to keep in mind if you are carting around heavy pallets, for example. Plus, in keeping with the other cars, there is still a three and a half ton tow rating. What is worth noting is there is no 12 volt outlet here in the back uh, that we have seen on some utes, so it is something to keep in mind. Um, but this is the thing. So at this end of the car, you're dealing with a highly practical, really sensible side of things. And it's using the added space that the Amarok, always widest in class, uh, was able to deploy to the market. So let's have a look inside now and see from back seat forwards, the Amarok still got what it takes. Now, while we're still looking at the Toyota and the Isuzu, let's just take a break here and have all three utes lined up and go through the tailgates, because obviously this is a pretty important part uh, of a double cabin. If you are using these as a de the, the de facto family car, you will be using this a lot. So let's have a look at the Toyota first, which is probably the most basic way to do it. And I, look, I just want to say, if you've got kids around here, be careful. Like that is a lot of weight to fall down and it is, it is really, really heavy. You've got no damping at all. You've got no support at all. It doesn't spring load to lift back up. It's just something to keep in mind, a very basic approach to the tailgate still on the Toyota Hilux. Let's check out the V-Dub. Right, so the Amarok takes a far more modern approach than the Toyota. Watch this. Now it still drops down, but it feels really, really light because there is a spring bar in the back there that's doing part of that work for you. So again, doesn't, uh, doesn't just sort of drop out of your hands like the Toyota does, but it is still quite, uh, quite a bit of a shock. You do need to lower it down, but it's definitely a far better system. While we're here though, it's worth pointing out, you've got two cup holders built into the back of the bed liner, plus there is a measuring tape along here. Now don't assume that everyone's a chippy and you're gonna be soaring up two by fours on the back of your brand new Amarok. We're down here at a marina. If you're fishing, there are certain fish that if you pull them out of the water and they're too small, you have to throw them back. What better way to do it? Flip them in off the reel, line them up on here, see if they're good enough for dinner. Otherwise, give them another swim for next week. Let's have a look at the Isuzu. Right now, we've seen the no dampening. We've seen a nice spring bar, soft, closed dampening. Take a look at this. 
Remember the first time you got soft closed drawers in your kitchen cabinetry? That is what a Suzu has done here. You've got gas struts on the back of this. So it basically, doesn't matter where you let it go from, it lowers itself down soft and easy. Now it's not as light to put back up as the Volkswagen's is because there is no spring bar to assist, but it's a really, really easy one to manage. So if you're looking for the gold standard of tailgates, this is what engineering does for you. Well done, Suzu. Okay, so, so far today, we've traveled economy, we've traveled premium economy. Have we stepped ourselves up to business? Well, no, but this is perhaps premium economy of a nicer airline that uses a weird kind of crocodile fabric motif on their seats, but more of that in a moment. So space-wise, let's get uh, through that one. I've got a stack of room. I've got good toe room. I've got good knee room. I've got great headroom, certainly compared to the Hilux. I feel like I am sitting higher than I was in the other two utes. It's sort of stadium seating back here. And as a passenger, to be able to have good visibility uh, out of the windscreen rather than just staring at a headrest, it's actually really good, especially if you've got smaller passengers like kids back here. So big tick there. The bench, like the Isuzu, is very, very comfortable. And the fabric feels quite nice, albeit with crocodile themed motifs on it. Uh, but it's still, you know, a ute. So we're still sitting a little bit more upright than we would be. You've got to adjust these headrests so they don't stick into the small of your back. But generally, it's actually really quite comfortable. And there's a few neat things here. So first of all, big window goes all the way down tick. You've got these handy pockets on the back of the seat and on the front of this seat as well. For sticking phones, for sticking things, if you've got kids, these are going to be full of minty wrappers and McDonald's french fries within five minutes of you taking delivery of this car. So just keep that in mind. Uh, you've got air vents. You, of course, have got the centre armrest and the biggest engineering bugbear of 2023, this ridiculous strap that means you have to pull it down to pull it out. That's gonna break off really soon. We said it in the Ranger, we'll say it in this. This is dumb engineering. Nobody needed this, it should just pull down. But anyway, stupid. You've got a 12 volt outlet, but you've got no USB ports back here. And again, it's 2023, you've got families that use these things. Kids have iPads, people use their cars for more than just sitting in these days. So I think we really do need to see that game stepped up, more USB ports around the cabin. But in general, back here, do you know what? It's all right. Now, if there's one element to the interior of a car that can kind of make or break, and look, in my mind, if you get it right, it really sets the tone for everything else, are the seats. Great seats make a great cabin, and these are fantastic seats. They are really comfortable, they've got good adjustment, they're really well bolstered. You could do miles and miles and miles in this thing and not feel uncomfortable, and I think that's a really big uh, step forward for the treatment of the cabin on the Amarok, because this is how these cars are used. These are big distance touring cars, so great seats, even with questionable crocodile skin theming on them, uh, really do start up the, uh, the, the cabin in a really good way. There's some other good points too. Um, let's start with storage. You've got cool twin glove boxes here, so a normal deep one, then a cool little hidey hole here that dips down into the cabin, because what we've seen in the, uh, in the D-Max and in the Hilux, they just sort of open up and they're level. If you're on a hill, all your stuff falls out. This one, it's all nice and, and kept in there, and you've got a cool fake carbon fiber style cover, uh, cover on it as well. The trim and components feel really nicely done. You've got no kind of clumsy, sharp edges. It's a really nice quality material, so strong fit and finish with some cool orange stitching in there as well. The buttons on the center stack, again, are really nice. There's only five buttons to choose from down here uh, and a volume knob. Brilliant, glad to see that coming back into fashion. So again, like we said with the other two cars, if you're driving and you're looking out there, as you should be, this is uh, a really easy area for you to control for some of these functions. Now the downsides. You've got the same transmission lever as in the Ford Ranger. Naturally, it uses the same uh, technical underpinnings, but this is a pretty kind of takes a bit of getting used to uh, shifter. You've got the clutch button here on the top, right? So you need to push in to pull back and pull, push in to push forward. It's a bit weird, whereas the, the standard trigger pull one, like we've seen in the D-Max and in the Hilux, are a lot easier to use, especially if you're on the move and doing it. It's kind of this weird sort of thing. So, eh, do try it, see what you think. You've got your uh, four-wheel drive mode switch down here perhaps not as easy as it is on the dashboard of the other cars, but again, really, really simple to be able to access, and it is the only feature down here, so that is another good thing. 
you've got obviously a digital instrument cluster here, this tremendously large uh, full-scale portrait display here, which does lift the modern uh, elements of the Amarox cabin, but everything else feels very Volkswagen. You've got a standard sort of Volkswagen switch gear on the steering wheel and on the, on the indicators. It feels upmarket. It feels familiar to, if you're coming from the old Amarok or any other Volkswagen product, you will feel right at home uh, in this one straight away. So in terms of first impressions for this cabin, and especially given that this car asks uh, a premium price over the, the other two competitors here, it feels more upmarket, it feels more modern, it feels more complete. And I think that's a really key thing because that's what we said about the Ranger. We know these cars were developed in the same way, but it's good to see that that cohesive uh, approach has been taken with the Amarok to its cabin the same way the Ranger did. Let's hit the road and see what the big V6 is like compared to the four cylinders in uh, our two competitors. Well, I'll tell you what, what a difference a V6 makes. Under the bonnet here is a 184 kilowatt, 600 newton meter, three liter V6. And it was the thing that changed the old Amarok from being another, albeit quite nice, uh, double cab ute to being something that felt like an SUV with a, a tub out the back. The six cylinder, it's a really weird one to describe, but it basically just feels so much smoother and so much more, I guess effortless as you start to drive. So at low speeds like we're doing now, it, the throttle response is lazy but but sure, and you know you've got that extra power and 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 uh, torque for for towing or load carrying or even just overtaking on a highway stretch. It's something that comes with just perhaps a little bit of extra surety that under the bonnet there's nothing that's going to to basically. Uh, well, nothing that's going to stop you, I think, is probably the way to look at it. And I think in this alone, now you can get a two litre in the, in the Amarok, just as you can in the Ranger, but I think the V6 is really what starts to set these cars apart. And it's a reason to consider a car like the Amarok over the other two, uh, first and foremost. And then in terms of ride, comfort and quality, we've already said the interior feels like a big step up from what we saw, even in the D-Max, which is a, a big step up on what we saw in the Hilux. Uh, but it is just a bit quieter in here. It feels really quite nice. The electrically assisted steering is very light, but also just the right amount of uh, weight to it, I guess. it's Again, it's a really hard one to describe that only sort of makes sense when you're driving it but you feel connected to what the car is doing. It doesn't feel overly assisted and it doesn't feel under assisted. And they're two really crucial points uh, when dealing with a car like this. But perhaps the most, I guess, noticeable thing, and we've traveled the same stretch of road for uh, these, these in-car presentations on this clip, you may see the Hilux moving around a lot more than you would have seen the Isuzu and even less so here in the Amarok. It just manages the bumps really, really well, especially as an unladen vehicle. And time and time again, we will often say that a ute settles. It uh, becomes far more predictable on the road when you put some weight in the back, because it will. It'll basically sit down on its springs and become uh, more of a, a cohesive platform that way. This has got nothing in the back and it still feels good. I can't wait till we try and load one of these up or start towing with it to see what it's like in those kind of situations. But certainly now uh, on these roads, which are hardly billiard table smooth, it's really quite happy and certainly quite comfortable and cosseting where it needs to be. And that's another big tick. Now in terms of technology, we've already said we've got the, the large portrait screen here. It is a 12 inch screen. It is uh, unique to the Amarok. You've got a pretty full featured system there. Uh, and you've also got a fully digital instrument cluster in front, a 12.3 inch display, which again is configurable and will change uh, according to your settings. These both help the, uh, the Amarok feel particularly modern and particularly upmarket in this sector. One thing of note though, is that in, well, I guess in current and typical Volkswagen fashion, all of the features of the car bar five buttons down here are contained within the screen. And that includes the climate control, which I'm not a fan of. I feel that climate control should use buttons and things uh, and should be a lot easier to get to than in the screen. But I'm sure once you get used to it, and again, once you set your temperature and have it on an automatic setting, it tends to work pretty well. But it is you know, something that you'll need to look at and consider, especially if you're gonna be spending a lot of time on the road uh, doing highway touring and needing to look out there before you touch down here. Now the points that you do have 
uh, on here, the buttons, you've obviously got the, the, the quick jump to your climate control menu. You've got the automatic parking functions. Uh, you've got the driver assistance tech and you've got your drive mode changes. Now, all of those are really, really useful to have as buttons because they're the things you tend to be changing dynamically as you're driving. So it is uh, a really good system. The other thing that you have down here is a, uh, a trailer brake control mechanism integrated to the car. And that's something that we have only seen, again, on the Ranger as a, as a new thing. But it is a yet another part where manufacturers are understanding how these cars are being used in real world situations and equipping them for for that, and I think that's another really good thing in the Amarok. Now, as traffic has sort of uh, dropped down a little bit and we're, we're on a higher speed limit road, we can really see what this V6 is like. And you put your foot down and to accelerate up, it's just so smooth. There's no sort of kick you back in your seat. There's no crazy Jekyll and Hyde uh, performance change. It's just syrupy smooth. And I tell you what, that is what you want in a car like this. You don't want to be shocked. You don't want to be surprised. You just want effortlessness. And that's what this engine provides. It's just a really, really nice power plant. Uh, in a car here. Now, we've come through a couple of corners as well. And again, for a vehicle like an Amarok, which is a ute and we're on all-terrain tires, it's very well behaved on the road. It's not rolling, it's not skittish, it's not moving around in a way that makes you feel uh, unsure of, of what it's gonna do next. Quite simply, it feels like an SUV. And Knowing what we know and knowing that people are buying double cab utes as a lifestyle extension to their lives, they are becoming uh, the de facto family car for so many Australian buyers because they work in so many different ways. They're practical if you are needing to, to, to work, whether you're we're running through some market gardens here, so maybe you're running a market garden. If you're towing, you're putting stuff in the back, you don't need to be and on the tools tradie to buy a ute anymore. And I think that is the big uh, appeal to vehicles like this. As a family SUV with a tub, which is kind of what this has become, it's already starting to feel a very accomplished performer in this segment, which is a segment full of very accomplished performers. Well, I tell you what, there are very few segments of the automotive marketplace that are evolving as quickly or as much as the double cab ute segment. It was only a couple of years ago that these were still considered primarily working vehicles. Sure, you got painted bumpers and maybe an infotainment screen here and there, but now we're talking about a V6, four-wheel disc brakes, integrated touchscreens. It's basically the new family uh, battlefield. And I think in terms of our three competitors here today, we don't really have a loser, but we have three levels of car that is kind of interesting for you as a buyer. So at the first level, you've got our benchmark, the Toyota Hilux. It is still a formidable vehicle. The engine is powerful enough, it's reliable enough, but it is still a bit rough around the edges. It focuses more on usability and I guess function over form. Next in line, you have the Isuzu D-MAX, a massive step up from where the old D-MAX was. It provides you with, well, as we said, economy premium levels of comfort. You've got delicious leather seats. You've got new technology. You've got a really quiet, cosseted cabin and a far more, I guess, pliable everyday ride, but it's still a ute. And then finally, we have the new Amarok. Now, forget for a moment that this car costs $10,000 more than the Isuzu and $15,000 more uh, than the Toyota because we're going to ignore the painted wheels and, and fancy stickers and look at that driveline and the revised suspension and that V6 and the 10-speed automatic. That car is an SUV with a tub on the back. It is so smooth, so tractable and so sensible as a, I guess, everyday family utility vehicle. And this is the evolution of the species. This has become an SUV with a tub, more so than a working ute with nice seats. And this is where we're seeing the market go. So in terms of our three contenders here today, they're all very solid cars, but that new Amarok certainly is an impressive beast. And well, I tell you what, the Ford Ranger up there on the hill has its work cut out for it to play with its cousin and see which one is going to be Australia's best ute. So we might need to call in a little bit of help for that next bit. Morning, your wish is my command. 
Mate, GB, it is always good to see you with these things because you're going to make for a very awkward family Christmas dinner. The new Ford Ranger, the current drive car of the year, will now face off against its cousin, the Volkswagen Amarok. And I tell you what, I reckon that is probably going to be even more exciting than this one. Now, of course, if you have liked what you've seen today, like, subscribe, follow, share with your friends. You know how YouTube works. But of course, if you want all the information about this comparison, great data tables, all the photos, head on over to drive.com.au. And of course, you can see where Glenn gets to by comparing the Ranger and the Amarok very soon too.